what we are planning to be several conversations about education in, in, in Delaware. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to to uh, walk with you today on this uh, 100th birthday of Dr. Milton Friedman, who is one of the Friedman Foundation and who also, as you know, is a is a, a very well-known visionary when it comes to education uh, and choice in education and informing. And that's one of the things that Caesar Rodney has very much tend to do is to take and increase the information available with regard to education and, uh, and literacy so that we better prepare our children. It's all in preparation so our children can live full lives, productive lives, and be contributors to our to our society. I'm also very, very pleased on this first one that we have to have another visionary in education by the name of uh, Dr. Ladner. Dr. Matthew Ladner is, uh, he probably, he came the furthest of anybody, he came from Arizona to be with us today. He is uh, very well known uh, in the field of education, civil rights, and education reform. Uh, Dr. Ladner is the uh, Senior Advisor of Policy and Research for the Foundation for Excellence in Education, and he has been uh, the uh, prior to that, Vice President of Research for the Goldwater Institute. He's also Director uh, at the Alliance for School Choice. Uh, he has been a prolific writer uh, on many, many articles in different uh, different uh, uh, magazines and publications, uh, but he's also co-author of the K-12 performance for the progress and reform for the report card on American education, which some of you probably have, have seen uh, throughout, the, throughout the years. He's not only been testifying in front of Congress uh, with regard to education and, uh, and civil rights, he's also the Commission of Civil Rights, and he's worked with a number of our state uh, governments, Florida, uh, I believe Texas, Indiana, uh, it seems like it was almost all the states that he has worked with uh, them and testified in front of state legislatures in order to uh, help and do that improve literacy of our children uh, across the country. So I would like you to give a warm Delaware welcome to Dr. Ladner and thank him for spending time with us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is my first trip to Delaware. So um, I grew up in Texas and I'm uh, currently living abroad in Arizona. And, um, <laughs> despite what you may have heard, not everyone in Arizona is crazy, just some of us. So, um, so as Jim mentioned, um, uh, today is the 100th birthday. It would have been the 100th birthday of Milton Friedman. Um, so, uh, in addition to uh, being a senior advisor at the uh, Foundation for Excellence in Education, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I'm also a, a senior fellow with the Milton Rose Friedman Foundation. So, um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to attend a symposium in San Francisco about the life of Dr. Friedman, and uh, they asked about six of us to write different policy briefs about different policies that Dr. Friedman touched on. I wrote the education one. And, um, <clears throat> Some of these, I didn't really appreciate what a, what a really fantastic, just great man Dr. Friedman was until I attended the symposium. He touched all kinds of different policy areas, and the one that was about ending the military draft actually made me laugh out loud on the airplane. I was reading it all the way to San Francisco, and I was laughing uncontrollably. Um, Dr. Friedman didn't view himself as a conservative. He viewed himself as a classical liberal, you know, someone who was interested in freedom. And um, late in life, he was interviewed about you know, what he thought his biggest impact on policy had been, and he actually listed ending the draft in the United States. And uh, so, Dr. Friedman was completely against drafting people, right? <laughs> and uh, he wanted an all volunteer military. And he had convinced um, Richard Nixon that this was the way to go. Richard Nixon was elected president in 1968, appointed this commission to study the issue. And um, there was the uh, general who was running the Vietnam War effort then, was named Westmoreland. Right? So, <clears throat> in addition to his, um, you know, he, Westmoreland actually took time out of his busy schedule mismanaging the war in Vietnam to oppose an all military, uh, uh, you know, 
course in the United States. And um, in a public forum, uh, Westmoreland made a mistake of crossing swords with Dr. Freeman and announced that he did not want to lead an army of mercenaries. And Dr. Freeman said, well, wait a minute, Dr. General, I'm confused. Do you mean to tell me that you would rather lead an army of slaves? <laughs> and Westmoreland said, I object. I object to you describing our, you know, our patriotic dra draftees as slaves. He said, well then, General, I object to using the term mercenaries to describe our uh, patriotic volunteers, for if they are mercenaries, and I am a mercenary economist, and you are a mercenary general, and you bought your meat from a mercenary butcher today. <laughs> and uh, that, that ended all, all of that right there. Um, the next slide. Dr. Freeman took an interest in education policy because he developed basically the strategy of using parental choice as a method to improve the, the results from the public education system. And he was interested in this because he understood that you know sort of the, the, the competitive process was key to making things better, right? Product, services, you name it. Now, some of you some of you are not, but some of you are, like me, old enough to remember that thing. Okay? Now, when I was a kid, I had a television that, or more like it, my parents had a television that looked like that up there on the top. Okay? And it was a big, giant, wooden piece of furniture, right? It had 12 channels, plus, the, I guess, the UHF, so 13 ish, right? It weighed a ton, right? And it was a little bit something. Giant thing you put there. Okay, well, economist Mark Perry actually took this out of the 1964, I believe, Sears catalog. Okay, and he adjusted the prices for inflation. Okay, so in 2010 dollars, that big, giant, antiquated, junky television set that no one wants now costs the equivalent of, in today's dollars, $5,300, right? That's how much, you know, you would have had to, you know, work to pay to get that piece of furniture, okay? So Perry then asks, what else, what could you buy for $5,300 today? And the answer is, all that stuff, okay? You start with a $700 flat screen TV, and then you buy a whole bunch of other stuff as well, okay? Now, not only do you get the big giant seven hundred dollar flash screen TV that has a thousand channels and is way better than the, you know, in addition to all this stuff, you get all this other stuff. Okay, why? Right. Well, it's because people have been trying to build a better mousetrap. Right. They've been working on building better and cheaper television sets. Okay. And even outside of electronics, you can look at a variety of different economic statistics, and what you find out is is that the world is getting better all the time. It happens very slowly. And we humans are kind of wired to idealize the past and think that it's better than the present. But the fact is, is that <coughs> this with any kind of, right? The world is getting better and cheaper all the time. Go to the next slide. Can anyone guess what this figure represents? It's like in a car. Yeah. You guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, that's the guess too. I'm looking for mine. That is how much in inflation-adjusted dollars this cost in 1982. Okay, how many of you remember the brick? So, okay, the brick had a bad battery. It couldn't store a single phone number. You couldn't download an app, and it cost a fortune. Right? It was basically a status symbol for Wall Street guys. So look how cool I am with my brick on my head. Right? Now I got this. This is antiquated. Right? I need an iPhone. Right? Bought this thing for 50 bucks. This thing has more computing power than the original space shuttle. Okay? 50 bucks. Okay? The world's getting better and cheaper all the time. Okay? Where do we not see this trend? We do not see this trend in education. Okay? Now, these are statistics I pulled down from the Digest of Education Statistic. What this one is showing you is the students per employee in the public school system, 1950 to 2007, okay? So back in 1950, we had 19, almost 20 students per employee in the public school system. 
they have now moved to 7.9. Okay, so it's a big increase in the number of employees per pupil. Okay, if you look at where this hiring is coming from, it's not the teachers. Okay, the blue column here is again is the entire public school system, 1950 to 2007, which is the most recent data I could find. Okay. Back in 1950, we had a million three, basically, teachers. Now, we have way more now, right? But look at the red columns. Those are the non-teachers, okay? Most of the, of the expansion in, in hiring of the school system has been outside the classroom. It's not teachers that are driving the trend on the previous slot. Now, all of this would be fine as long as we're getting better results, right? I don't care how many people you employ per pupil as long as, as you know, the results are better. But if you look at the nation's report card, which will be the source of most of the data I'm going to show you today, and this is a national set of data that's given by the federal government to random samples of students in all 50 states, and it is the main, some would say, the only real way to compare state to state. If you look at the long-term trend data, going all the way back to 1971, <coughs> these are uh, reading scores. What you see is flat, right? It's not that there's this lost golden age where, where you know, the, the people learned a lot better in it, okay? It's that, you know, kids were learning, you know, about the same thing in the past then that they're learning now, but we're spending a lot more to get the same not-so-great results. This is even more disturbing data. Uh, this is from the PISA, which is an international exam. And when you, when you look at this exam data, what you find is, is that American elementary school students do pretty well. Our middle school students are kind of in the middle internationally. And then our high school students are relatively, they're not absolute bottom, but they're, they're closer to the bottom. The really disturbing stuff comes when you start breaking out American scores by uh, income and ethnicity groups. This is showing you the, um, I believe these are math scores, um, breaking out American students by ethnicity. What you find is, is that American, African American, and Hispanic students score closer to the lowest performing country that takes this test, which is Mexico. Okay? They score closer to the scores in Mexico than they do to, say, South Korea, which has the highest scores. Okay, and that is despite the fact that we spend so much more than these other countries. Okay, the United States is spending, you know, about twice as much per pupil as they are in South Korea, despite the fact South Korea is getting the best results. Okay, and way, way more than Mexico. Okay, so in our discussions about education here in the United States, we are quite appropriately concerned about the role of poverty. Um, I can tell you that whatever our poverty problem is here in the United States, it's far worse than Mexico, right? Mexico can't afford $14,000 a kid, right, in the first place, right? You know, do we have poverty issues here in the United States? Absolutely we do. They're far worse than Mexico, okay? Um, so, next one. This is from, again, from the nature of uh, the long-term trend. And what you see is here is this is evidence of the racial achievement gap, which is huge here in the United States, and really a, 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 it should be a source of national shame. Bottom line is is that the 12th grade African American Hispanic students who do get to 12th grade, okay, now mind you, the dropout rates are much higher for these students. Of students, and if those students were in the sample, these numbers would look even worse than this, okay, but. They're bad enough already. <coughs> Basically, your 12th grade African American and your 12th grade Hispanic students who make it to the 12th grade score, on average, a level of academic achievement that is comparable to an 8th grade Anglo student. Okay, they're four years behind. Okay, despite our high spending, despite the other things that we've done. Okay, so we've got our share of problems in the K-12 system. Right? And I don't think, no matter where you're coming from philosophically, if you're a libertarian, a conservative, a liberal, a vegetarian, whatever you are, right? <laughs> the desire from our public school system is that kids will learn how to read, that kids will learn the numeracy skills they need to succeed in life.
right? That's what we want from our public school system, right? And right now, there are too many. You know, public, I'm a public school kid. My mother is a public school teacher. I graduated from public schools. Um, you know, the point is not to bash public schools. That's not why I'm here, okay? But it is certainly the case the public school system is not delivering for far too many kids. And we know who the majority of these kids are, okay? Um, you know, this is not something that any of us, again, conservative, liberal, whatever, no one should be willing to tolerate what this chart is telling us, right? Regardless of where you're coming from, Americans all believe in some kind of equality of opportunity. And our system is not delivering that for a lot of kids right now. So we need to change it. So, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, I'm sure many of you remember uh, Senator Moynihan from New York. Um, Moynihan is an interesting guy. He's obviously a, a titan of thought, of uh, left of center thought in the United States, but he's also kind of revered by a lot of conservatives. Uh, George Will writes about him frequently in his columns and likes to joke that Senator Moynihan actually wrote more books than most United States senators ever read. <laughs> um, Senator Moynihan used to have a joke about the racial achievement gap, and he was actually joking about the NAICS course, the ones that I just showed you. Um, Moynihan said that performance on the NAIP is perfectly correlated with your state's proximity to the Canadian border. Right? And if the state wanted to improve the NAICS scores, what they need to do is pick up and move closer to Canada. Right? Um, these huge disparities between Anglo, Hispanic, and African American schools is what he was talking about, right? The states in the country that are dominated by Anglos and whatnot. Um, and um, for a long time, we kind of floundered trying to find anything to do about that. I'm going to show you some positive results from, from uh, one state here that has done something about it. But I think Senator White had to be quite happy to see this map today. This is a map of fourth grade reading scores from the NAEP, same data that I was showing you earlier, where I have isolated the scores of Hispanic students in Florida and compared them to the statewide average in these other states. Okay? This is from the 2011, the most recent NAEP exam. And the, uh, so it's Hispanic students in Florida compared to the statewide averages in all these other states. So. Just to give you an example, Hispanic students in Florida, fourth grade reading test that's given only in English, right, are outscoring my home state's statewide average for all students, okay? And they're not outscoring us by a little bit, they're outscoring us by about a grade level's worth of progress, okay? So I live in Arizona, all of our kids in Arizona are in the Arizona average, right? All of our Scottsdale kids, our suburban kids, you know, kids that live in Flagstaff, <coughs> you know, Prescott and Catalina Foothills and all the fancy parts of Arizona, we're there in the average and we're still getting beat by our standards in Florida. Okay? Um, some of those states, you notice, are pretty close to the border of Canada. Okay? Florida put in a comprehensive set of education reforms in 1999. It included a lot of parental choice, but it also included a lot of other things. I'm just kind of stepping through what they did. But the results have been quite impressive. Florida has gone from one of the worst performing states in the country on NAEP up to being one of the better performing states. And this is despite some very challenging demographics. Now, I'm not here to tell you that everything about Florida is great, right? They're a work in progress. Um, they did the things that they did in the teeth of enormous opposition. And now it's getting more difficult to oppose this stuff because it's obvious it's work. And I think it's not, but it's not the case that Florida should be viewed as all oh, the paragon. Let's do what Florida did. It's more like, let's figure out what worked about Florida and then do more. Okay, because, you know, going from a poorly performing American state to a fairly well performing American state, it's not good enough, right? You know, it's not good enough because the United States is a poorly performing country, right? We need to set our, our side higher than that. So, Florida, again, big state, 2.7 million, 
a majority minority student population. Anglos represent a, a small, it's got 15 cases of the, the Anglos are on the small side of that. Um, large ELL and a fairly poor state. So about half the students in Florida are uh, pre-reduced lunch eligible. Whatever education problems you could dream up, they exist in Florida, right? Students from overseas, check. Students that don't speak English coming into school, check. Inner city, big dysfunctional districts, check. Rural areas, check. Okay, they, they, whatever problem you want to dream up, they've got it. Okay. All right, so broadly speaking, uh, Governor Bush came into office in 1999 and he pushed through a set of reforms. Uh, they were vigorously opposed, especially by the Florida Education Association. Um, and at a 30,000 foot level, I would say that the two main, actually say three main thrusts of the reform to one, transparency, two, parental choice, and three, some incentives. Okay, people don't like to talk about incentives in schools, but it turns out incentives don't stop at the schoolhouse door. So, the uh, first linchpin uh, is the one that's been through the process, so I don't know the next one. Um, And so the first step was to grade schools A to F. Now, when I go to the airport in Phoenix, I pass by this elementary school that has this big giant banner out front, right? And it says, such and such elementary, we are a, and then it says performing about 10,000 point point. Performing school. Okay. But what they didn't tell us but people look at that and they say, hey, performing, that sounds good, right? Performing is the second lowest possible uh, label you can get in Arizona. There's only about, you know, 20 schools in the whole state of Arizona that get something worse than performing, okay? Performing is the equivalent of a D, right? It sounds good, right? Um, that's the reason we have to just followed in Florida's footsteps to do what Governor Bush did in 1999, and that is to adopt clear labels that people can understand, okay? The critical difference about A through F is that I got scale, got it. C is eh, B is better, A is great, F, problem, D, problem, okay? People understand that instantly and instinctively, okay? There's no funny business <laughs> Now, the way Florida assigns the grades is also really important. And just to kind of um, go through this quickly, about half the grade is based on your overall state scores, proficiency, what percentage of your kids pass, pass the test, okay? The other half of your grade, however, is based on student learning gains. Where was the child at the end of last year? Where are they at the end of this year, okay? And the clever part is this down here. So it's basically 50% proficiency, 25% progress for all students, and then 25% is the progress of the students who scored in the bottom 25% from last year. Okay. When you work the game theory out in your head, you're a principal in Florida, you say to yourself, self, only one group of students that count in all three of those categories. All right? They're up here, they're in there, and then they have their own category. Now, you don't necessarily have to get the kids that scored the bottom 25% of last year's test to pass this year, although you want to do that, if you want to, right? But you better make them move in the right direction, because if you don't, bottom line is you're going to get stuck with a C, or maybe something worse than a C, okay? Those kids became the most important kids in the school building as soon as they did this. Okay? You gotta get them moving in the right direction. You can't just forget about them, right? You gotta get them making progress. Now, you can imagine how controversial this was. There were a lot of people who said, oh my God, the great schools, the schools that we receive in the F will go into a cycle of decline, you know? The exact opposite happened, okay? What actually happened was, is that I call this truth in advertising. For the first time, before this, Florida had fuzzy labels, 
At one point, they were grading schools one, two, three, four, five, but no one knew whether a five was good or a one was good. It was just a mess. Okay. What actually happened was is that people rallied around their schools. Okay, thousands of people went to the public schools in Florida to volunteer to tutor kids. Okay, you had business executives mentor school principals about you know how to make the trains run on time and whatnot. People what got taught, you know, told the truth, truth in advertising. They they they, they knew they had problems in education, but now they're being honest about it, right? This lets you move to the next stage. Okay, we have a problem. We're going to be grown ups about it, admit that we have a problem. But what do we do about it? Okay. Rather than the cycle of decline where these poorly graded schools just fell off the map, right? What we actually saw was a quick flip. The first year in 1999. There were more DNF rated schools than A and B rated schools. When you looked at Florida's NAEP schools, that's about right. That's how many there should have been, right? Florida was a terribly performing state for NAEP. But what quickly happens is, is that you see a decline in the number of DNF rated schools compared to growth in A and B. Those dotted lines you see, each one of those was an instance where the Florida um, State Board of Education actually raised the standard to become an A or B school. There's actually one here that's later and it's not on here. Four different occasions, they made it more difficult to become an A or B school. Despite that fact, you saw this big improvement there and a large decline in the number of DNA rated schools. And all of this is confirmed by the NAEP scores, which are totally independent of this. This is using the state scores. The NAEP is a different test administered uh, by the federal government. So rather than this sort of cycle of doom and decline, what we saw was substantial improvement. Okay, school choice. Um, this was, you know, kind of Dr. Friedman's theory. You can, Dr. You can really simplify it. The way I simplify this in my mind is that you say, why are the schools in, you know, fill in the blank, Newark, Detroit, big sitter city X here in America? Why do they perform so poorly? Right? There's lots of different reasons. Dr. Freeman's basic theory is, is that one of the reasons an enabling condition was is that they can't lose students. Right? Bottom line is they don't lose students because they do an awful job of educating talent. You know, we have a lot of schools for a long time that were more or less warehousing the kids. Right? Not a lot of learning going on. So Dr. Freeman's theory was is we need to give those parents more choice about where they go to school. And there will be sort of competitive upward down pressure. So in Florida, um, they did a lot of this. Florida has a very strong charter school law. They have a pre K voucher program. They are the nation's leader in digital education through the Florida Virtual School. It's really neat. You know, high school students in Florida now are starting to decide if I want to take calculus and move to SNP, or would I rather take it through the Florida Virtual School? Uh, Florida Virtual School only gets paid if the child successfully completes the course, which is something you can say for the, the district system. Um, Florida has the largest tax credit scholarship program in the country. It's called Step Up for Students. It's like a double income student and some kind of a different public or private, mostly private school for choice. And finally, the one I want to kind of focus on here is the uh, students with disabilities. Uh, Florida has the largest school voucher program in the country, and only for special needs students, students with disabilities IEPs. And I think that it's useful to look at this in a little bit of detail because it kind of really shows you that a lot of the rhetoric around school choice is far from the line, right? Now, a lot of the stuff you get is, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are gonna come in and destroy the public school system. Let's see what really happens. Um, the McKay Scholarship Program was created in 1999. It expanded statewide in 2001, okay? Every single special needs child in Florida is eligible to be given a scholarship worth up to $22,000 for these children with without multiple or severe disabilities to go to a different public or private school of their choice. And they have had that ability since 2001. Okay? Well, if we look at the numbers, today there are 374,000 and change students with disabilities going to public schools in Florida, which by the way, is just as many as it was back in And there are about a little higher than that now. It's about 22,000 students using the McKay Scholarship Program to go to mostly private schools. Okay, about five percent. Okay, 
right? After a decade, with a voucher program, about 5% of the students should have been out of school. Where's the apocalypse, right? There is no apocalypse. Now, what's been going on with uh, test scores for children with disabilities in Florida public schools? Let's go look at the data. Okay. Now, um, on these tests, I'm going to show you raw scores here. 10 points equals about a grade level's worth of progress. Let me just try to explain that. Um, if I gave a group of fifth graders the fourth grade reading test on eight, I'd expect them to do 10 points better than fourth graders. Okay. So, this is a chart showing the test score trends for what I would argue are probably the most disadvantaged students in the public school system anywhere. These are low income students with disabilities. These students qualify for the pre reduced lunch program and they have a disability. Okay? I'm showing you here the comparison between Florida and uh, Delaware. Now, let me start by saying that Delaware could look a lot worse than this. I've seen my numbers just fall out the cliff, quite frankly. Um, it could be better, but it could be worse too. Not a lot worse. Uh, back in 1998, this was the year before the reform started in Florida. Average for these types of students was 152 in both Delaware and Florida. 152 is awful. I mean, it's awful. These kids are not just illiterate, they're profoundly illiterate. Okay. Now, you can see progress in both states. Okay. Uh, ultimately, you know, in 2007, uh, Delaware kind of topped off and started falling off. Um, whereas in Florida, it didn't improve. There is about a grade and a half level difference between those scores now. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's been evaluations done in the McKay program that has found that it is associated with higher learning gains in public schools as more kids use the McKay programs. This, the students with disability scores in public schools go up. Uh, there have been satisfaction surveys done for uh, the parents that participate in the program. They love the program. It's not hurting anything. And, go to the next slide, if we compare the overall academic progress for students with disabilities, and this is for, again, using NAEP data, using all four tests, uh, fourth grade reading, eighth grade reading, fourth grade math, eighth grade math, and measure all states that have been doing this test since 2003. When you look at the states that are meeting the reporting requirements, and that's tricky, but I won't go too much into it, but um, there are a few states, including Maryland, that don't test 70% of their kids with disabilities in this test, and that, that throws things off. So, um, um, so if you exclude the people who aren't really testing their <laughs> students, what you find is, is that Florida's made more academic progress for children with disabilities than any other state. Okay? There is no evidence of harm in the public school system whatsoever, and there's good reason to think that this is actually helping. Okay. Uh, another big thrust of the Florida reforms was curtailing social promotion. Um, the Andy Casey Foundation made a really interesting study where they tracked a large group of students mm -hmm. over a long period of time. And what they found was is if you look at the 19 year olds and go back and look at where they were. Find is, is the kids were struggling with reading in third grade are the same kids who drop out of school. Okay? 82% said no. It's only 11% of dropouts for kids that had their third grade reading mm -hmm. out. Okay? Uh, and kids drop out for all kinds of different reasons, right? This is very, very telling. Now, the best research that we have on literacy and acquisition shows us that we basically have a window of opportunity. It's not that dissimilar neurologically from learning a foreign language. I could go study Danish right now, but I'm always going to sound like a redneck from Texas trying to speak Danish. <laughs> right? I can't do it. This is why Arnold Schwarzenegger still speaks with that heavy Austrian accent, because he learned English too late in life. Reading is like that. It's not impossible to learn how to read after third and fourth grade, but it's really, really hard. 
Okay. Now, what happens in American schools is, is that we have a large group of kids who don't learn how to read in the early elementary grades. Okay. They are first graders who don't know how to read. Second graders, third graders, now you're in the problem. Okay, now you're in fourth grade, you can't read. Okay. The way American schools have typically dealt with this is simply pass them on to fifth grade. Okay. The problem is, is that grade level material keeps going up, right? Grade level material becomes more sophisticated, more challenging every year, and you can't read. So now you're an eighth grader, you're sitting in an eighth grade science classroom, you've got a science textbook in front of you that you cannot read. <clears throat> the school system has been kind of pretending like this isn't happening for quite a while, right? You know, you're kind of faking it, right? And they're letting you fake it. You can't read your science textbook. These children become bored. They describe themselves as bored, right? They often become disruptive discipline problems, they are, they may not be able to read, but they're not dumb. Like, they know they've been given the short end of the stick in life. They don't know why. Like, but they know that college is not for them. They know they're not going to university. They don't even know what they're doing. What am I doing here? This is a waste of my time. And they drop out of school. Okay? That's what's going on in our such a huge problem, but it's right in front of our faces, and we don't do anything about it. Right? And the, your pipeline, your dropout pipeline, is created in kindergarten, first, second, third grade. Okay? So part of what Governor Bush did in his life is, and by the way, this, this should not be a partisan issue at all. In 1998, the State of the Union address, um, in fact, President Clinton mentioned social promotion three different times in three different State of the Union addresses. And this is what uh, President Clinton had to say. And I couldn't agree with him more, <laughs> right? Um, you know, there's this idea that somehow we've got to hurt the self-esteem not to advance the child. Some say that's cool. I say that the current status quo is what's cool. Okay? And it's fair enough to get them to do something about it. So, what they did in Florida is they put a stop on this, okay? Because the literacy research indicates so strongly that it is important for kids to learn how to read from third grade to first, second, third grade, okay? So part of what Governor Bush did in his life is, and by the way, this, this should not be a partisan issue at all. In 1998, State of the Union address, um, in fact, President Clinton mentioned social promotion three different times in three different State of the Union addresses. And this is what uh, President Clinton had to say. And I couldn't agree with him more, <laughs> right? Um, you know, there's this idea that somehow we've got to hurt the self-esteem not to advance the child. Some say that's cool. I say that the current status quo is what's cool. Okay? And it's fair enough to get them to do something. So what they did in Florida is they put a stop on this, okay? Because the literacy research indicates so strongly that it is important for kids to learn how to read from third grade, they put in a stop. Where there is a lot of formal notification, it's early, not just the third grade, okay? A lot of early formal notification, there are family literacy plans drawn up, there are volunteers brought in, Number of interventions, there are you have multiple chances. So the bottom line is multiple chances on different tests, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, the bottom line is, is that in Florida, after starting the 2002 2003 school year, if you could not show them FCAT 2, okay, FCAT's their state test, there's five levels to it, one is the lowest, and five is the highest. <coughs> By the end of the third grade, you needed to show some progress in reading. Have to be proficient, but you have to like not be profoundly, utterly, and completely illiterate. Okay. The default becomes that you can't get an FCAT 2 degree if you can't read. Okay. There was some good.
good cause exemptions and you know, there are special cases. Okay. But the bottom line here is that um, this was a very powerful signal <coughs> sent out, not just to schools, but also to parents. Okay. One of the things that all of these policies have in common is that all of them are basically from involved generators. Okay. <coughs> when you get the notice as a second grade parent, um, that your child's not on track for reading. Oh, by the way, there's this policy now where if they don't pass, not even pass, but they don't score X in third grade, they'll be retained. That gets your attention, right? Uh, parents and skilled teachers have been using this, right, to get parents involved. You know, like your son is in danger of being retained. This is what we need to do to avoid that, right? We need to send you home homework. You better start doing it. Right? We tell you to read your child and have them read to you. I uh, might want to consider actually doing it. Right? So they put this policy in place again, enormous opposition. It was the first year of the policy, 13.2% of third graders voted for it. You can imagine what that was like. Oh, by the way, this was a new election year, so I wish. Right? Um, hugely controversial. Uh, but the bottom line is that the results of this have been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, notice um, the red columns here are the percentage of kids scoring at Cat 1 at that horrible little level. Okay. Look at the trend. Okay. The blue columns are the percentage of kids being entertained. Okay. That's not the trend you can see. You can see they have not even more impressive. the policy, 41% of African American students in Florida were scoring at that one reading. They could not read. Okay? 26%, 26% is too high. It's a lot higher than 41%. Uh, green line is Hispanics, 35% of those around 19. Blue line is for all students, 27%. children are being retained now for, for exactly the right reason, because more of them have learned how to read in the first place, right? which is what we should want. Right? Uh, prevention you know, is worth a pound of cure, an ounce of it. Right? I mean, so um, this is a kind of policy intervention, quite frankly, you just don't see very often. It's not very often you see us try anything and see anything like these kind of results. They drop from 41%. 26%, which in the course of 10 years among African American students. It's nothing short of remarkable. Yes, sir. What was the drop? I believe it's a drop between 2001 and 2006. Yeah. The drop there. This is a good question. This was something went wrong with the state passed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, really, those numbers should be kind of thrown out of your mind. Um, so, they, they, you know, so I, don't, I don't even actually know exactly what it is. There was, there was some kind of mess up with the state cut. Um, so let me get something to next. The last big thing that we did was to uh, incentivize reading. So the, the idea here was um, the state picked up the cost of having everyone take the PSAT test in fifth grade. Okay? And then um, using, and it was actually pretty cheap to do that, you know, you get the whole discount when you do the whole state. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, with that data, they actually had a, a partnership with the college board that runs AP now to identify students who have the potential to pass AP coursework, right? But we're not currently on track to take AP coursework. Right? These are students that have been underrepresented in Florida's universities, low-income students, African-American students, Hispanic students, Primarily, not exclusively, this wasn't you know, a race-based program, but, um, and in addition to that, there was a bonus created. So the bottom line is, in Florida, for every student who passes one or more advanced placement exams, not per exam, although if they had more money, maybe they could do that, right? Uh, but if you pass one or more exam, the state sends $700 to the school, okay? That money does not go through the normal funding form. It's not touch the hands of the district. It goes directly to the school, and the staff at the school decides what they want to do with them. 
most of the time they decide to give themselves uh, bonuses. Sometimes they buy new equipment or new books or library or whatever, it's up to them, okay? Of that $750 per student goes to the teacher, the teacher that, you know, that, that taught the AP course. And, uh, the teacher can earn a bonus of up to $2,000, okay? So, um, there was also the progressive element put in, so that if you were here at school and you got one or more AP exams, that $700 bonus turned into a $2,000 bonus. Look at the result. Um, since it, this is, this is uh, red columns are Hispanic students, blue columns are African American students. These numbers are still too low. Okay, there there ought to be more than 19,000 Hispanic students passing AP exams. Okay, but uh, it's more than three times higher than used to be. Right, the number of African Americans passing. Is three times higher than it used to be. Florida now has the highest Hispanic AP passing rate in the country. Okay, it is eight times higher than the state with the lowest Hispanic AP passing rate, which I'm quite ashamed to admit is the state of Arizona. Um, I'd like to see Arizona do something like this so we can move in the right direction. Yes, ma'am. I may not be thinking right, but is it for scores? For a number of students um, increased more under retention rates than bonuses or incentives? That's hard to say. I mean, um, these are high school students and those are elementary students. So, oh, okay, so you don't have um, to, for example. But yeah, but you know, the, the, it's, you're, you're getting at a really interesting question that I get a lot though, which is I have a lot of people, as I talk about these different reforms around the country, especially lawmakers, they always say, okay, which one really did it? <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. It, it's right, which is totally natural. You want to know that, right? Well, no, it's, it's well, I'm thinking which one is best for the child because if more children <clears throat> that were retained went on, yeah, most of them haven't, they, and they haven't aged enough to get okay. into this code work quite yet. Um, but you know, the uh, the bottom line is, is it's really it's difficult to disaggregate, you know, this, I mean. It's one of the, it's a situation where they tried lots of different things all at the same time, and collectively they have very positive results right now. Um, but um, so sometimes I'll have the lawmakers say, "Well, okay, well maybe we could do that retention piece. We could do the retention piece, but just don't expect full time results unless you do the other stuff too." Right? <laughs> um, I think that it's a, there's an old saying that says that. Uh, you know, when you're in a downward spiral, the way to attack it is from all sides at once, and, and that's 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 basically what they did in Florida, right? I mean, they took a number of different strategies that they had, you know, enough research on to think, on a theoretical basis, that it would improve things, right? You know, they thought that if they did this PSAT and identify kids and get an AP coursework, they'd see good results. They did, right? They thought that if they did a lot of total choice of stuff, that they would see some positive pressure coming from the bottom up and get some good results. And they did, right? Now, um, all of these things were really, really, really high as she emphasized, completely opposed by, um, by the <coughs> teacher unions opposed all this stuff, okay? Um, and in fact, in 2002, Governor Bush was elected to Governor Ford in 1998. In 2002, he was up for re-election. Some of you may remember Janet Reno, uh, who was Attorney General under President Clinton, ran for Governor of Florida that year. Um, the, uh, the Florida Education Association did their polling and they figured out there's no way Janet Reno is going to beat Jim Bush in Florida. It's not going to happen. Right? Even if McNaughton's might have something to do with it, I don't know. Um, so, the uh, the FDA actually went and recruited a candidate to oppose Janet Reno, um, who was a wealthy trial lawyer from Tampa, and they they muscled him through the Democratic primary. He got the nomination, and then they took out a second mortgage on their headquarters building in, in Tallahassee and dumped it into this guy's campaign. Um, they lent staff to his campaign. They took leaves of absences from the teacher union to go run his campaign, and. Um, I mean, basically, I view the 
just I mean, this is the historical record. You can read about it. You know, um, you know that they were really, really desperate to regain their control of Cape Home policy. Right. The bottom line is, is they departed from the usual way of doing things. You usually don't do this stuff. You don't retain kids. Um, we can talk about that. I don't. I. I am absolutely convinced that there's been a lot of bad research done on retention policy, and there's also been a lot of bad retention policies. Okay, so if you talk to people at college of education, they say, "No, we know retention is automatically horrible. It's terrible." Blah blah blah. Um, like for instance, in Texas, um, where I grew up, uh, there was an informal policy called redshirting. Okay, and the way redshirting worked was that the state gave the state exit exam in tenth grade. So the districts would red shirt a whole bunch of ninth grade students. You could go in and look at the retention, like, like the size of the cohorts by grade level. So, you know, but it was hugely controversial, and it still is hugely controversial today because there are a lot of people who, when you say retention, they think of bad policies like that one in Texas. Right? It is important to do this correctly, right? Um, but, you know, the bottom line is, is cumulatively with all these policies, uh, Florida, you know, we have the name data, which is very highly respected. I mean, Florida went from almost being dead last. They got off the floor and they got a lot better in a very challenging demographic, right? This is not like doing it reformed in New Hampshire or something, you know? I mean, um, so, you know, that, that's kind of the end of the presentation. I, I think that kind of the punchline here is that, that people in other states should be studying Florida and experiences in other states. Um, and we should be bolder, right? Um, the beautiful thing about all this is, is that Governor Bush, you know, really, really staked all his political capital on getting this stuff done. He got beat up for it, okay? And he was operating on a basis of theory, okay? We can go into the NAEP data now and see what actually happened, right? We know what they did, and we know what happened. Now, ascribing particular games to particular policies is very tricky because they did a bunch of different stuff all at once. But the bottom line is, is that we kind of departed from the old way of doing things, and we got some results. I think that should embolden us to go further, further, to do more than what Florida did. Um, and uh, the bottom line is that I don't think we have to be like those slides I told you earlier. <laughs>